According to Doug Spada, when he wrote Gauntlet, he was just working with sounds that he liked, emotions and emotional effect. He didn't really have any scripts or stories in mind for this. He just he just had a, a palette of sound that he liked and, and, and wrote it down. Your students may compare Gauntlet to some of the movie scores that they've seen. It does kind of sound cinematic. Um, they might, it might remind them of, of a novel that they're reading at the time. And it, it's interesting because a lot of these, I've noticed a lot of these novels that, that students read um, sometimes end up becoming these Hollywood films. And so it starts off as a book and then it becomes a movie. Like The Hunger Games was that way, Twilight was that way, Harry Potter was that way. A lot of these popular novels end up being blockbuster motion pictures. And and when you're reading, there's a higher level of abstraction because you're just getting the words. And what's going on is they're reading the words and they're taking those words and they're using their life experience, okay, what they know, and they're, they're taking these abstract words and they're 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 comparing it to their life experience, comparing to things they know, and coming up with imagery, and they're filling in the gaps of knowledge with their imagination based on what they know. And music is the same way. Although Doug Spada didn't have necessarily a, a program in mind for this or, or, or things that are in mind, he was just dealing with sounds and stuff, we take those sounds and we compare them to our experience of what we know, and it starts to create imagery in our minds and help us to be able to tell a story. And music's more abstract even than, than text. It's, it's one of the most abstract art forms there, there are, especially in, in absolute music. And so it relies a lot on us as listeners, as, as conductors, as, as performers, to be able to tell that story even if there's not a lot of evidence, concrete evidence of what that story is, you know, we leave it up to our interpretation, make something out of it, and then be able to send it off into the world. Hey, here's our story. We're going to tell it through music. Sometimes if I read a book and then it becomes a movie later, what I expected to see in the movie isn't always what I imagined from the book, right? And it's like, oh, I thought that character would have been this way, or I thought this would have been this way. And, and it's interesting because somehow through abstraction, it gives the work more depth because it relies more on us to use our imagination to be able to, to tell the work. And sometimes when we really like a book and we go see the movie, sometimes we're a little disappointed because sometimes that depth gets removed. But with music, we can come up with so many different interpretations and ways to make it exciting that it will never get boring. How many different ways can we play these quarter notes here? We could brush them. We could bounce them. We could play them cole. We could play them on the string. The basses will probably play it on the string anyway. There, there's a lot of different ways that we can play it, and each one is going to change the color of it a little bit, and we're going to get a slightly different sound, and it's going to mean something a little different depending on what we do. The same thing with the staccato eighth notes. Depending upon how we play those, we're going to get some different effects. So you might want to experiment. It just says short. It doesn't say what to do. That's up to you guys to figure out so that you can make this music sound dark and energetic. Depending on the bowing style that you choose, you, you are going to have some advantages and, and disadvantages. Sometimes you have a bowing style and it might be harder to bring out the dynamics or you know some bowing styles make it a little bit easier. When we're playing spiccato, things are a little different than they are when we're playing arco. For instance, if we use more of a, a vertical bounce, it's going to sound a lot softer because it's less time that the hair is contacting the string. Whereas if we use more of a horizontal stroke, the hair is going to be on the string longer and that's going to make it sound louder. So when we're playing arco and we're using a 
horizontal stroke. It's going to be a louder stroke than if, than if we're kind of playing here. That's going to be a softer sound. So we need to make sure that our students understand how to play loud and soft if they're bouncing the bow. We want to choose a bowing style where we can develop this and, and get a lot of shapes. You know, it, it's going to be really boring if we just like play quarter note, quarter note, quarter note all the time, you know, from the beginning to 10. Um, that's not really going to work as well as if we create create some shapes. So if you use a bow stroke where you're able to phrase a little bit more, it's going to make this far more interesting to listen to. And you're, you're likely to do better in the musical categories at your contest or festival. By now, your students should also be working with vibrato. And I would recommend that to enhance some of this, particularly like at rehearsal 10, where we're we're shaping up and down with these longer note values that you start to get your students to experiment with the rate of speed and the width of your vibrato as we crescendo into measure 12. I would have them try to increase the width of their vibrato a little bit more and maybe vibrate a little bit faster. You know, in this case, it would be really good if they knew both wrist and arm vibrato, it might help them be able to create a new dimension to the phrase and help to color this phrase in a different way as we go through it. And, you know, that would be really cool. Now, if, if your group is just trying to get through this, you know, if you're just trying to get through this, this contest or evaluation, you know, do what you got to do. But if, if they're ready to explore a little bit more, um, vibrato is a big part of this piece and, and the way it colors these phrases. In season one, I did an episode on vibrato and I have some techniques in there to help students learn how to relax their hands so that they can vibrate more effectively and learn things like finger vibrato, wrist vibrato, and arm vibrato. Um, if you're playing through some of this stuff and they're shorter notes, some of your students might want to experiment vibrating on the short notes because short notes have to be beautiful too, right? And maybe they want to try some finger vibrato on the shorter notes repeated notes, whether they be repeated quarter notes like we have here at the beginning or repeated eighth notes like the violas have here. We have repeated notes, notes that happen over and over and over again. I like to equate them to whole notes when I'm thinking of, of how to use vibrato. Now here at measure nine through, through 12 violas have, they're playing 24 A's in a row. Now, that's the equivalent to three whole notes. If you were sustaining three whole notes tied together, would you use vibrato? I probably would. Hopefully, your students would too. So why don't we use vibrato if we have 24 of the same A in a row? Um, effectively, it's, it's, it's kind of the same thing if you th you know, as, as far as the left hand is concerned. So I would, I would have your students experiment with vibrating those, those A's on the G string for, for that section too. All right, at 56, we have a style change. The notes get broader, the dynamic level drops back down to piano, and we have a lot of these whole note, uh, half note, and then we have these quarter note passing tone shapes here through, throughout. I really like how Doug Spada, you know, has voices entering and exiting. We kind of have the orchestration uh, thinning a little bit, and then he expands the orchestration back out in different places. Um, over here, measure 70, 71, you know, he has the cellos and basses drop out, and then just cellos, and then we get our basses back here before 73. I think that's pretty interesting. When voices are, are exiting and we're left just with our inner voices and, and our cellos, it creates more of that intimate sound. And then we start adding other players in to create a little bit more depth. And it, it does give it a special character and it does give it a style that's much different than we have in the A section and, and at the A section at the end too, because you know pretty much all of that is short. And this is long and smooth. For me, this section is a lot less aggressive and, and maybe more, more peaceful. It still has this, this uh, anticipation of what's about to come. I mean, there's no doubt that the A section is going to come back. 
but for for this it, maybe it's more like the calm before the storm and I, I really like this this B section here and when I rehearse it that's where I start my rehearsals is at 56 and then we go back and work on the other stuff so at 80 we get the A theme again and I really like the writing here at 95 too because Doug Spada kind of takes some of the stuff from 56 and puts it in the first violin part. They're now playing lyrical and over the top. Now it's a little different because they have these descending lines here in 97, 98, whereas before they were ascending half notes, slurs up here, up here. So it's different in that regard. Um, you know, in, in 98, we get this clash here with the, the violas. We got this B flat against A, and then now there's A in the violas against G in, in the first violins. So that's, that's going to be interesting. The second statement of it, though, um, the violins just go down to a D, um, which is they're now at, in a fifth with the violas. But that's some really good writing, too, and it's a really great ending to this piece. If you can get them to retain that style from the B theme with, with more sound and get everybody else to play that aggressive A style, it kind of takes elements from both sections and ties everything together before we end up with this double down bow to finish the piece. In the next video, we're going to talk a little bit about tempo, and we're going to look at what Doug Spada thinks about tempo and try to apply that to gauntlet and maybe try to come up with an appropriate tempo range that's going to help us out at a, at a contest or evaluation. So we'll see you in the next one.